Hello everybody, uh, my name is Cornel Volak and I am an assistant professor at, uh, of clarinet at Queen's University um, in Kingston, uh, Ontario. It's a beautiful, beautiful town. I hope one day you guys can, can visit us there. Um, I don't know how much I should introduce myself, but uh, yeah, I do a lot of playing, a lot of teaching, touring and so on, but I have a profound uh, and, and, and really strong interest in how the embouchure works and how the staccato works and how all the muscles you know are being connected and so on um, and that interest led me to a collaboration and, and research now uh, with uh, a wonderful team at the University of Toronto uh, where I um, I was able to um, uh, get to know wonderful professionalists that allow me to use the lab and conduct um, uh, you know collect the data and they have all the know-how and have the tech and all that and all that so um, it is a complicated matter we all know it this is why ambition is one of the most difficult parts of clarinet and, and any woodman performance and it's worth every minute to to educate ourselves on how it works in depth of its dynamics and and uh, basically what it can do, it cannot do. So out of that collaboration, two major written books on clarinet technique came up. Um, I authored the articulation types for clarinet, where I talk about um, you know, uh, how to articulate, what articulation types are out there available uh, to us besides the obvious ones. And uh, the second book is on embouchure. And I was able to perform on the articulation, um, uh, sorry, uh, present on the articulation uh, in Orlando a few years back when we were all together in person and so on. And now I would love to present to you on the embouchure drills. So embouchure drills, hold on, let me get onto it. Um, embouchure drills is basically um, this is a, a, a set of non-musical exercises. Uh, this is not that you would practice like out of music, that there is sheet music necessary for it. Um, these exercises are basically meant to train to raise awareness of the player uh, on what they are doing while they are performing, while they are playing, how quickly they can make dynamic changes and anticipate the upcoming changes in air pressure and so on and so on. Also make us aware of um, how we control different sets of muscles that make up our embouchure. Uh, it's extremely important. I got, I was um, actually inspired um, by athletes. I am a very mediocre, like a really beginner tennis player and uh, uh, a coach with whom I used to work a little bit, he would spend most time in the gym and I really understood how much time you spend in a gym training different groups of muscles, like preconditioning them, only then to go on the court and um, put blend all their skills together, but consciously to avoid injuries, to in, increase endurance, to uh, increase awareness, and to be more flexible and therefore effective. So this entire booklet is about how to be more aware fle and flexible uh, in our ambitions, of our ambitions and in our ambitions. So as I found out throughout my career and through teaching, that correcting the embouchure doesn't really ever end. It is a process. It's, it's, we have to always have like this tiny little compartment or department called embouchure department at the back of our mind. Even if we are the most skillful player in the world, when we perform, we cannot like shut down that department and just perform. No. Uh, we always have to dedicate a certain percentage of our awareness while we play to the embouchure. Um, and so 
I would like to start with um, I, I start my my booklet and my presentation with some standard you know glossary of terms because I use those terms throughout the booklet and when I do teach so it is clear to everyone what I'm referring to and how these processes are being described um, so it's to never omit the obvious, uh, as one of my mentors told me, um, it's important to say what do we understand by ambusher. Um, in this work, ambusher is a state of a dynamically balanced tension between the muscles that form and sustain it. Because ambusher is not made out of, you know, marble. It changes all the time. So, I find it not the most effective command when I ask my students to keep the ambusher firm at all times and never change it. Uh, sometimes it can be quite confusing because it has to adjust, let's say, even when we change registers or articulation types uh, throughout our performance. So, so, it has to follow the air pressure changes and ideally, sometimes, anticipate it. Then I distinguish from uh, the, just the term ambusher um, two other um, types of ambusher. One is the working one which is uh, the ambusher in the process of playing the instrument and the stand alone ambusher which is the ambusher that we form when we do not have instrument in our in our mouth. Uh, important distinction though because we strive for perfection and when we have this perfectly beautifully looking ambusher, um, when we form it or when we teach someone how to form it, it is almost unattainable in real life um, because of the changes that happen while we perform. Then I explain what dynamic control is. And that is an important term to keep in mind because this is another term that you would I use and I encourage others to use while teaching and that refers to the real-time adjustments of the ambusher done in anticipation of changes in the jaw slash air pressure. Um, then explain, I go on to explaining what back pressure is, what voicing is, jaw pressure, tongue position, decoupling of various ambusher parts. That's an interesting one. I would like to pause here for a sec. Um, decoupling is important when we train different tiny little muscles of our ambusher because when we play and we don't decouple then we cannot evaluate our ambusher properly. We know something may not work to our satisfaction or to the satisfaction of our students but it's sometimes difficult to pinpoint which part of the ambusher is an up to speed until we remove certain elements all right so that is decoupling and i find it extremely helpful for myself as well as the students that i pass that knowledge on to and then at the end i also would like to pinpoint that effortless playing Again, it's something that sounds pretty obvious, but it's not. Um, occurs when no energy, strength of muscles working with the ambusher is either lost or used in excess. Um, injuries of ambusher and discomfort or even pain or quick fatigue of it happens when there is some disproportion in strength distribution that sounds slightly too scientific but it's another way of saying that one part of the ambusher is working too hard therefore it is not in balance the reason i'm going over it for you uh, for most of you um, out there this is all so obvious and it's as clear as day but um while teaching ambusher like i was probably i am a, a, an example of someone who was taught ambusher in a very very general broad terms um, and I had no understanding no intimate understanding of what it was that I, I was doing inside and how to train it so um, understanding the theory behind it and the inner workings of it is as important to some even more important 
than just the, the regular daily routine practicing exercises and because it can help avoid forcing it to do things that it doesn't want to do or that don't come naturally to the ambusher. All right, because we're limited um, as far as time goes, I will not go over the entire book uh, with you, but I would like to present some um, of the um, uh, of the exercises. Most of my exercises that I describe in this book um, begin with this position, meaning I would not u encourage using hands. I would rest the hands on the lap and start playing with the clarinet using just the embouchure, the natural weight of the instrument and the finding the right angle, head position uh, and the posture at the same time um, to just internalize how it feels and how it actually sounds. The moment we add hands, there is another huge part of brain that gets activated that very often takes over the process of thinking of the embouchure. That is one example of what I called decoupling. All right? So that's in the materials. Then I go on to explain exactly what embouchure is made out of, all the parts and where they are. So when I refer to them, I often use this diagram here to pinpoint the parts of the embouchure I'm referring to so the students, they can visualize it. Um, and then I go to, um, I, I actually, if I go back just a little bit, I would like to go to this uh, table of content. I divided um, all the exercises to four parts and they are divided because of the major parts of what that, uh, that make our make up our ambusher which is the, the lip, the jaw, the tongue position and the air pressure. So I divided them in that particular order. So yes, there is method to this madness. <laughs> um, so moving on, I would like to start with the first one and this is how they are being um, described. It's basically, there's a name, they're, they're called um, differently. One is called, the first one is called Talk and Play. And then there is a description, then there is step-by-step -step explanation, how it should feel and what it should do and how it should help. And then in the book there is um, always uh, uh, um, a picture and then here I have the luxury of showing you the moving picture so I will explain the idea behind talk and play when when I try to teach someone ambusher from the scratch for instance I want the ambusher to naturally fall in place and be driven by intuition of the player before I unload too much information and um, talking is usually where we find when we just what we do uh, instinctively and very naturally. So I just find it a logical comparison as far as a, a, a muscular activities go to forming the embouchure. So I would ask to put the client in the lap on the lap between the knees, then rest the instrument gently halfway through the lower lip, just like that, right, halfway through, right, like that, just rest it, and then leave the hands away, and just talk with me, you know, this is a very good exercise for beginners, so I ask them to actually get used to something touching the lip, and to talk, and not to lose the clarinet, so I would ask them to move like that, and feel the lower lip, and then make it more firm, don't let the clarinet move too much, and then going from talking to playing. So roll the lower lip slightly in by gently tilting the head and then play. Talk to me and then play. And do it interchangeably. So I can be talking to you explaining the ambusher 
and actually making the sound without complicating the matter. So that's one of many very simple, well, some of them are <laughs> less simple than others, exercises. Um, and then I go through lips versus jaws, for instance, to decouple the lips themselves, the ring muscle of the lips and the supporting muscles around from the brute force of the lower jaw that causes biting, we call it biting, excessive jaw force that translates onto pain that very often um, comes as a result of um, not well balanced ambusher, the force distribution. So I devise losing as little jaw pressure as necessary to produce the sound. And then to decouple the jaw pressure from the lips, I would ask someone to put um, the thumb uh, against the upper lip, right? Uh, and then and then create the ring of the lips around it. Huh? Like that? Mm -hmm. And then, so you feel the lower teeth on the fingernail and the upper teeth on the soft part of the uh, of the thumb, right? And now, so you control, you can feel on your thumb whether or not your jaw is moving or if it's biting. You can feel it immediately. You get the biofeedback on your thumb. So now, can you move or can the student move the lips independently from the jaw? That's a $1 million question. And people have a lot of fun doing this. So you put, you mimic the clarinet mouthpiece. Huh? You just very gently put be between you, it between your teeth and then move your lips to the side. Look, front to the left, front to the right. Now, without moving the jaw and without biting okay so i wanted to share these two exercises with you before we run out of time um uh and just so we can even have a, a little bit of a discussion um about um hold on about the book and maybe you have some questions i wanted to show you the little animation of it you see I uh, hope it will play. So you move to the right, to the front, to the left, back to the front. Okay? So you don't bite. You don't add extra jaw force when you are moving your lips. Well, that's called control. Eventually, that will translate onto sealing the corners of the mouth. Very often, there is air leaking through the corners we, we we usually say um not to do it or to to take a little bit more lip in or to keep the lower lip a little bit curved in um but usually you know the idea is you practice more you get more strength of this large muscle here and it will keep it intact but really what it is is to just be able at will to control the corners separately without adding this crazy force from the lower jaw which is the primordial sin <laughs> of all of us clarinetists, when, especially when we are under pressure uh, of performing. So, but when you add more pressure to the jaw and you blow air out, what happens, it will pop out the corners. So the whole key of well-balanced ambusher would be not to add more pressure, just enough so the clarinet starts sounding in tune, the reed is control, and the rest is facial muscles at work. And I could walk you through the book for, uh, you know, probably quite a bit longer. Uh, the next one would be uh, practicing the buzz, the control of the tiny little muscles, um, and so on and so on. I just want to get out of the um, full screen, so maybe you could also see um a little bit of what's going on here there's plenty exercises 
uh, Hissing Reed is a fabulous, is a, a, I would love to share more of this to you, but I understand that there is a time constraint. And um, perhaps at this point we could maybe do a tiny little bit of Q&A. If you would like um, to get more familiar with, with this, uh, with my work, I would greatly encourage you to uh, go to my website, kornelvolak.com slash, you know, dot com. I just posted it in, in, um, uh, in the chat. It's available there, and then there are some also other things that you could um, look over. Uh, but for now, I would love to open the floor and maybe have a few of you um, talk to me. It's kind of difficult not seeing you, but it, it would be lovely to, um, to get some questions going if you, if you have some. I would like to get your thoughts and on, on the matter, whether or not you think this kind of exercises uh, are needed or practical. For instance, I use them for a very short period of time. So when my students, let's say, practice a study, they would stop for like, you know, half a minute and, and check, do a little drill and check, you know, if, if they can do it and then go back to playing. Just so the awareness is always moved back to the, to the middle ground. Um, I see there is a question from Janet Green. Thank you, Janet. Would you speak to the engagement of the upper lip in the clarinet embouchure? That is an incredibly important issue that is often uh, overlooked. Thank you very much, Janet, for this question. That drill that I just showed you, lips versus jaw, that is a wonderful exercise to train your upper lip to seal properly around the mouthpiece when you gain more awareness of the muscles that are moving it um, around, the, around the mouthpiece, then there's a new gate that opens up that helps you figure out how much of the lip is comfortable um, to keep over the mouthpiece. Whether you want it really closely to your teeth or you want it to cover the mouthpiece a little bit more, um, but that will depend on how well can you control your upper lip. Therefore, awareness needs to be increased. It has to, your, your brain needs to get into your upper lip by challenging yourself doing something that is out of your comfort zone. Unfortunately, folks, you know, we can't move forward as musicians or professionals in, in any area if we stay in our comfort zone. So some of these exercises, some of these drill, drills, as silly as they look, they really push you out of your comfort zone. So, uh, and nobody has to, can or have to see you when you do it. So, so that's the advantage. Thank you, Janet. Um, um, there is a question, how can we get more life instruction? I am available through Zoom. You send me an email through my website. Uh, or perhaps ICA, uh, if, if ICA holds any further clinics on, on embouchure or technicalities, I'd be happy to participate because this way a lot more people could be reached, but you can always reach me individually and I do that online very often because believe me, there is a whole lot of people out there who really have the time and energy and curiosity to spend on on the embouchure. So I'll be very happy to serve you uh, with with answers to the best of my knowledge, of course. Um, nobody knows it all. Nobody can claim that, that there is the end to learning about embouchure because every time there is a, um, there is a, a, a body, physical body involved, muscles are involved, training is necessary. And, and if we want to get very specific results, and as clarinetists we do, we do need to have specific drills for the muscles that control what we do, or the instrument, right? So there is logic behind all that, and um, I encourage you to check it out, um, please, and shoot me a message. We can connect via Facebook. Uh, I'm available through social media. 
um, you can find me online. This this world is small now when we are all living on online. Uh, I hope that I provided some food for thought and perhaps uh, some positive, um, well-intended, you know, challenge for our personal growth as uh, as clarinetists um, controlling our embouchures. So embouchure is a very special, I would call it, place where the music, where the sound begins. And the amount of, of uh, uh, um, acoustics that are taking place at that very moment versus the body limitations is incredible. We don't have even the lifetime to study that if we want to play music, right? Um, but we do need some sort of uh, resources that will help us to maintain the embouchure and increase its flexibility because let's end on a positive note um because a healthy embouchure is a flexible embouchure a one that that reacts to what is happening in real time all right if there is some inflexibility in the embouchure there is pain and there is injury uh janet again uh, asks us me uh, what steps do you recommend to help students who come to you with TMJ jaw pain um, there is a drill that I use um, 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 here really that is called you see bite me not and so when the student, when the person with TMJ is able to open um, their jaw, because some, in some severe cases, people cannot open the jaw. Actually, I know that for sure, because I had that when I was a teenager. I overpracticed <laughs> under pressure because I really wanted to impress everyone playing my Weber concertina with orchestra, so I overpracticed and my jaw. I got TMJ and I couldn't open even the jaw. So if the jaw can be opened, then um, what you want to do is um, you want to put the clarinet again in your mouth, right, very gently, so you are not adding any force or any weight to the instrument with the hands. Um, and then get the instrument in your mouth, right, but then do not, I repeat, do not touch the top part of the mouthpiece with the upper teeth. It's not double lip embouchure. You can see it here, okay? So the teeth are not touching. So you have to drop the jaw. So if I were to demonstrate how it would sound, it would be like... You see, my entire jaw is dropping. Right? Right, and now you can hear only the air going through. And now you take the student's finger or your own finger and then you gently apply just enough pressure on the top of the mouthpiece for the reed to start vibrating and stop there don't go any further. So, to teach the embouchure, to increase the awareness of the injured embouchure, how little pressure is needed in order to produce the sound. One has to be very, very gentle with the embouchure. We are talking about tiny little muscles, like a few millimeter long. They're like baby little muscles that we are throwing this huge, you know, air pressure at them, and and we expect them to like be strong and and provide and provide and perform. Um, let's remember that that these are tiny muscles. We are athletes, as musicians, we are athletes of little muscles. So in order to, to bring back the confidence in building the embouchure of someone who has TMJ, 
one has to take a few steps back, forget about using hands, because hands do complicate the matter for the embouchure because they press up, right? The thumb, the right hand thumb is the part of the embouchure, right? It regulates how much uh, pressure against the upper teeth there will be, uh, how the client will be wedging into the mouth. So let's drop that. And then the upper fingers, they when, when they actually start pressing, especially left hand, they don't only do this, they also do this. So there's a lot of pressure on these baby muscles, you know. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, uh, for these wonderful questions. And I'm glad, Janet, that I was able to, to help you out at least a little bit. Please shoot me an email anytime, cornell.wallack at gmail.com or visit my website, or just go to IFEA website and find me through there. Um, oh, there is a question uh, about how your exercises interact with mouthpiece and read choices as well. Yes, they do, in a big way. Um, basically, when the idea of less being more, meaning using less force on every front, upper lip, lower lip, lower jaw, hands, whatever. If that idea sinks in and one uses only enough pressure, dynamic pressure, to produce beautiful sound with good intonation, then the whole equipment, the idea about equipment changes into being lighter, more embouchure friendly, you know. No more reads number five, <laughs> so to speak, unless your mouthpiece dictates that, right? But one becomes overall more um, holistic. This is a more holistic approach to the ambusher. Well, um, Jessica, I can see you came back. We're probably already running out of time or even over time, so I, I don't want to be selfish and steal anyone away from everybody from other person's presentation, and it's a logical point too. To probably stop great this is great and i i encourage you all to to seek out cornell's uh, materials um we've had them reviewed in the the journal and the clarinet so um you can check those out um it's really really helpful to see this breakdown on a on a very fundamental level and we all know that we've had issues with biting or you know different fatigue, you know, leaking. I, I suffered from, from air leak for a long time until I understood what exactly I was doing wrong and to fix that. So this is really helpful. Uh, and again, I think cornell.wallock at gmail.com, correct? Yes, certainly. Yeah, so, um, this is great. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that our next session today starts at 1230. Um, it is on YouTube so you can find the link for that uh, on the website and in the guidebook app and we will have this session if you joined us late it will be up on YouTube uh, pretty shortly and I'll send you the link for that as well thank you so much happy clarinetting everybody <laughs> all the best thank you thank you Jessica thank you Alexander thank you ICA bye 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 <laughs>